Welcome to our complimentary webinar, which is brought to you today in partnership with Cisco Auscontact's national diamond sponsor, and it's entitled Aligning Organisational KPIs Around CX Strategy. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, and during that time, with the help of today's special guests, Vinod and Jamie, we hope to spark your interest and engage you in the conversation, as well as provide you with some ideas to take back to your respective businesses. To round off the session, we'll be having a Q&A at the end of the webinar. I'm Fiona Keogh, CEO of OzContact and your moderator for today. While we're waiting for everyone to join us, let's use the time wisely to quickly run through some housekeeping with you. Remember to interact with us to maximise the benefit and as you know, there's no need to take too many notes because we'll be providing you with the recording of the webinar. So, to interact with us today, please use the Q&A panel. You can ask questions and or make comments for Vinod, Jamie or myself from time to time. Don't forget, we're going to have a full Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so please type your questions as we go along so you don't forget to ask them. If you're listening through headphones or speakers and experience any issues with your internet connection, please let us know. And you can raise your hand to uh, ask for assistance or refer to the confirmation email, which will have the link to the webinar and all the relevant phone numbers and access codes that you need. I know that many of you are familiar with asking questions. So let's try out the Q&A panel. And the question for today is, and it's a trick question, is how many kilometres are you able to travel from home in Melbourne? It changed very recently. And Jamie said to me, as we were just waiting to come on, who knows, it changes all the time. But it's, it's now a big number. It's a double-digit number. Ah, Andrew knows the answer. Well done. Well done. And it's actually quite nice because I can actually, if I'm in Sydney, I can actually travel to work. But you're not allowed to do that yet. Ah, Gary knows the answer. Well done. Bruce knows the answer. Okay, so we've got quite a few people who know what the answer is. Andrew, no, I'm sorry. You need to put a two in front of your, your first number. Um. So we can act, David also knows. So we can travel, just for those of you that are not up to date on the news, 25 Ks, which is very good, but not as far as we'd obviously like to travel. So with that, now that you all know the answer, that it's 25 Ks, I'm very pleased to introduce Spinon, who is the Chief Growth Officer from Cisco Contact Centre. Spinon, you're a brand new voice to our audience. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? All right, Fiona, thank you. Um, so I'm coming from further than 25 kilometers away. Um, it might be, might be closer to 10,000. I lead growth and go to market for Cisco's contacts in a business, uh, but my heart is actually in customer experience because uh, my startup, which got acquired by uh, Cisco, which is called Cloud Cherry, um, focused on helping brands understand their customer experience and take business decisions basis that. But my real love is really cricket. Uh, and I couldn't be happier that India defeated Australia in cricket last year. So um, with that joy, I will hand it back to you, Fiona, or maybe take the proceedings forward. All right, so I think it's time for us to get started. All right, so with me is Jamie. Jamie runs our business in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Japan and China. And we're gonna start with a simple question for you. What does it mean to be an experience-led company or experience-driven company? Now, the reason I start with this question is because almost everybody says they are experience-led, but not all of us do enough about being truly experience-led. So to find out where we stand on that spectrum of absolutely experience-driven to what are you talking about, we have a couple of polls for you. So the first poll really is, how many of you run a customer experience program which has listening, data analytics, complete mapping to business goals, and that these goals, data and analytics are tracked periodically. So that's a holistic customer experience program. You have only three choices. 
uh, yes, you do. No, you don't. And then you're somewhere in the middle. So there's either an absolute answer or you're stuck somewhere in the middle. And soon after that, you're going to have a second poll. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to answer that, of course, which is what CX metric do you use? Is it NPS? Is it CSAT? Is it a custom metric? Or what are you talking about? So Jamie, you've worked with all the large brands in the region. You've seen programs from Southeast Asia to the Far East, um, to Australia and New Zealand. What have you experienced? What's your answer to this question on, on behalf of the hundreds of people you've interacted with over the past few years? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Vinod. And I think um, certainly over this last year, it's changing, right? I think um, why companies are looking at this metric and, and the, the importance they're placing on the different metrics is changing. It'd be interesting to see some of the questions come through. You know, we find that, you know, going back to um, the original question you had, you know, how many customers are mapping, um, mapping back to a business outcome? We find that most of you, most customers out there in the region, are, you know, roughly 75% of customers are actually mapping back to a business outcome. And that business outcome could be, you know, net promoter score, um, customer loyalty, customer effort score. We're seeing more and more, especially this last 12 months with COVID, that there's a higher importance being played on on revenue, right? Revenue associated through interactions, um, purely because the touch point that you're having with your customers is is mainly via via you know a digital or, or a verbal interaction, no longer in a store. For those of you in a in a retail or a service based organisation, um, so yeah, it's been quite interesting to see the shift and change over the last twelve months. I'm glad you say that. So interestingly enough, I was actually reading a shareholder letter written by the co-CEOs of, of Telstra, uh, and it actually spoke about NPS as a, an annual goal. It actually spoke about uh, how that number was audited, and it was tracked as a financial business outcome. And that's really where we are. CX has gone from being a fuzzy outcome to highly tangible, highly quantifiable. So obviously, that is why we're here. That is why all of you have like, dialed in. And I'm here to give you some perspective on what I've learned from working with at least 100 companies on their customer experience programs. It's really, it really starts with flipping the coin um, and, and, and choosing what the customer wants you to do and not how you look at the customer's journey. And from a customer's perspective, I know almost everybody on the call must be a CX practitioner, but I'd want for us for a moment to stop thinking about CX from our lens and put on the hat of a customer ourselves, which is how do we perceive an interaction with the brand ourselves. And for us, it's really around three vectors. It's ease, effort, and emotion. You usually interact with the brand because you want something, you're looking for something. How easy was it for you to get the outcome you sought? The second, obviously, is effort, which is how, um, obviously, when you did it, you got it, but did you actually spend a lot of effort? Did you take a lot of steps? It could have happened in a day, but did you feel that it was grueling? But most importantly, even if you got what you wanted, if you got, and it was easy for you to get, how did you feel at the end of the experience? You could have been served super quick, and yet you felt that the brand didn't care about you. And if you look at it from a customer's lens, you'll find it much easier to build a customer experience program. And as you think about building a customer experience program, the first thing you'll realize, even though we're in the business of selling your technology, what we learned after a good many number of implementations is that being experience driven requires more than just technology. So while we have every technology you need to measure, analyze and improve customer experience, the real IP actually resides with you and that is what we intend to talk about today. So let's talk about the three elements of, of brand experience. So the first level really is an organization which is, has armed and empowered its employees. It's not just um, uh, the ones at the contact center, it's the ones in the stores or the branches or wherever to basically understand and meet customer needs. It could well be the invoicing department of a company whose job is to basically collect money on time. Now you could do that by telling somebody, hey, you're two hours late, give me my money, uh, or understanding that customers sometimes miss their payments and having an empathetic way of asking for that. So great customer service is at the heart of it, but it is really step one. But if you want to really go on and build a holistic program, the second tier of that, of that CX program is one where you are designing your touch points to meet customer needs and create value. When you know the customer journey, when you understand what customers are looking for and how you could meet that need, you're basically orchestrating these, these experiences to meet customer needs and sometimes ahead of time. 
But at the apex of this really is a program and it takes a lot of time to get there, wherein you're actually experience led, which means you're not setting up a process or a system or a touch point and then figuring out how your customers perceive it, which is what we do today. You're actually designing that touch point or that experience with a deep understanding of customer requirements, customers' preferences. And it's not always what the historic preference was. It's actually with a view on where the preference is actually headed, which means you're using the power of predictive analytics to understand where the value lies. And these are the three elements of um, brand experience, really. But you have to end up building a customer experience program. And from our perspective, we've seen that any customer experience program, if you stage it, really has three stages. And the first stage of that, really, the baseline is to listen. If you're not listening to your customers, you don't have a customer experience program, no matter how much science and how much technology you throw at it. So the base of it is you listen to your customers. The next is really the ability to analyze that data, which is much harder than it, than it is to say it. And if you've really done all of this and you've done it really well, you should be able to predict the actions which will drive the outcomes that you seek. So at this point, I have a poll for you because at the heart of listening to the customer is a deep understanding of the customer journey itself. So the poll that I have for you is do you actually use customer journey mapping to measure customer experience? So the point is, have you done, the choice A really is, have you done customer journey mapping? and you use it. The next is a lot of companies that I meet. I remember that workshop we had for three days where we did a lot of journey mapping, but I'm sure those blueprints reside somewhere. And the third is what's customer journey mapping. It sounds interesting, but I've never done it. So please do feel free to take the poll uh, and let us know what you think. Now, if you've never done it, and it, it might well be that you have a, a fairly decent survey program that's running, but the survey program is either owned by different stakeholders in the company, or it's basically run ad hoc, or it's run at periodic intervals. I remember when somebody once came and asked me, how often should we send out an NPS survey, or how often should we send out a survey? Uh, my answer was that the question was wrong, because it doesn't matter how often it is, at what touch point do you need to understand the customer's experience, as opposed to how often should you be asking the customer. That said, you should definitely not be asking the customer too often. Um, anyway, okay, if you've had the chance to do that, let's move forward. Now, from a listening perspective, as I said, you may say I have a survey program, but that's usually inadequate. To understand what a customer's experience is, you need to almost live the customer's journey vicariously, which means you have to replicate the customer journey and journeys that a customer goes through. So for example, if you're somebody who's, who's retired and you like to go into a physical location and spend your time and speak and get your work done. That's a very different customer journey as opposed to somebody who's getting their stuff done on a mobile. So both of them may have made a transaction, but just because it's the same transaction doesn't mean the journey is the same. So you'll recognize in your own journey, let's say with a, with a retailer or a bank or, or a telecom operator, that your journey actually happens over days, weeks, months, and years, sometimes at multiple events in a day. And each journey is unique and it's different. And of course, it goes through multiple touch points. It may be at a physical location, it may be on the mobile, it may be on social media, it may be via email, it may be in the contact center and so on and so forth. So the first element of journey building and visualization is the ability for you to visualize the journey and listen and engage to the customer along the entire journey. Now, when I say listen to the customer along the journey, I don't just mean running a survey. I mean the ability to obviously measure the pulse of the customer, which is direct and indirect, which is to read and understand what the customer is saying, but not directly to you. It could be a, a review somewhere or some other verbatims. And it is inferred, which is the data that a customer leaves along their journey without exactly giving it to you, which, which is how much time they spent on a website, what did they look at, what did they click, how much time did they wait for your agent at the contact center. All of these are elements of feedback that the customer is giving you directly or indirectly. And having all of this is what encompasses a truly data-rich customer journey. Now, once you've had the customer journey, I actually don't want to run into too much theory. And I'm, before we come to the theory of building a program, I actually want to talk to you about a, a real experience. So we worked with a telecom operator close to a billion dollars of revenue. And the problem was really close to almost something many of you would be able to empathize with, which was we have teams running in silos. They run their own surveys. We have an overall satisfaction sort of a survey running, but there is no real, real time summarization of this feedback. And obviously we are worried that we are over surveying our customers because 
this team sends a survey and then the other team sends a survey. There's no centralization, right? And the customers probably sometimes hit with, we, sometimes we don't touch a customer for a year and sometimes we send them three surveys in, in a day and both of which are a problem. So this was the business problem that we were confronted with when we first came and met them. And when we looked at solving that problem, for us really was how do we provide an outcome to that customer? So we obviously first recommended that we do a holistic customer journey mapping exercise. We understand what are the touch points that matter to the customer on the journey that they're going through. We also wanted to obviously bring together different teams. So every team had to see, you know, the topic of this, this, this webinar is aligning organizational KPIs. You have to understand that each team's KPI is not always the KPI the customer wants. I'll give you the simplest example. If you have a call center where the agent is incentivized on average call handling time, which means that the agent is supposed to boot you out of the call as soon as possible. Now, when the customer is calling up, let's say regarding a lost card, for example, the customer is in serious strife, right? They're, and they pretty much dialed their crisis line. If you have an agent who's incentivized by call handling time, and the customer is really distraught and the agent wants to demonstrate empathy and spend a little more time talking to the customer, just to make sure he or she is okay, they're actually going against the KPI that you've incentivized the, the, the employee with. And that is what I mean by bringing all organizations along the journey. So everyone understands what KPI is important for the customer and not always important for the brand. So when you do that, you're able to look at the entire journey holistically and focus on continual improvements as opposed to silver bullet sort of, uh, you know, fix this and everything will be okay kind of a solution. Now, what we did working with them was we did the entire journey mapping exercise, mapped out the touch points. We are currently live with 22 touch points across seven channels. All of the data rolls uh, up to a single dashboard, and then it rolls down to different levels in the organization with role-based dashboards. So if you're handling a certain touch point, you only have touch point level data. If you run an entire team, you have team level data and the leadership of course has view. If you see, of course it's a, it's a mock visualization on the right, but the leadership team essentially sees the image that you see on the right, which is a view of the entire journey, the, the CSAT or NPS scores along those touch points, key drivers of those so that they're able to see if I were the customer running through these touch points, where is my experience dropping off and where should the organization focus? on making that important. Obviously there's fatigue rules, which means even though now you touch interface with 22 different touch points, there is a rule around how often we can reach out to you. Now, the real time dashboards obviously help in decision making, but something very interesting happened. And I want to turn to Jamie here because when we set up this program and it ran for a year or two, they did something fundamentally radically different from what most companies do. So Jamie, you want to give some perspective on what this yielded? Yeah, sure, sure to note. I, I just want to touch quickly on something that was on the previous slide, right? You mentioned a moment ago, you know, over-surveying and we don't want to over-survey our customers. And I think one of the cool things that this customer did was, you know, using the fatigue rules, uh, enable them to analyze how many times they're touching a customer and, and when is the right time to touch a customer. But more importantly, when is the right time to stop talking to the customer, right? It's to not sort of tip them over that point of, you know, you're over communicating. So that's really, a, that was really a key component here. I, I think the, the next part, you know, to, to the outcome that this customer achieved, it was, you know, uh, you know, breaking down those silos and giving each each owner of, uh, the, you know, the, make, giving, um, creating individual owners for each stage of that customer journey, right? And then giving them metrics as to what they're trying to achieve, you know, what is their overall goal for that stage of that customer journey and making sure that it, it rolls up to the overall um, outcome that the, that, the, um, that the customer wants for their customer, right? Or, or for the, the, that you want for your customer. So that was a fundamental shift in the way they approached it. Um, and again, like everything, as Vinod has been saying, making sure that, that you know, it starts with a customer journey, understanding what you want your customer journey to look like, and then putting in owners who are accountable for every single stage across every touch point of that customer journey to achieve that overall, overall goal and outcome. I'm glad you say that. And, and the, at the risk of repetition, I want to highlight just how important this is. Most organizations are divided in a way that makes it easy to manage the organization, right? So we split sales teams based on geography because, hey, you're in Australia, I'm in the United States. So, you know, it's hard for us to coordinate. So why, don't, why doesn't the Australia team run as an Australia team? But the point is, when you re-architect and you, you change the roles of people to own parts of the journey, 
you're saying let's focus on what's important for the customer and you are the owner of that customer outcome and that customer touch points which means your kpi aligns with what makes the customer happy right and obviously then drives the business outcomes of the company but really it is putting the customer first and this is fundamentally different i don't know more than a handful of companies that actually do this and at the heart of a really well running customer experience program is the willingness to change your team orientation and structures based on the journey of the customer that is almost a utopian state all right so that's the journey part i think we've made that point but let's go at what do you do with the journey now i told you about how the customer gives you a lot of data and information along that journey so this data could be in a crm in clickstream analytics tools it could be in your marketing software there's a lot of data on what the customer does what the customer's propensity is what their loyalty model is what their transaction history is and the ability to use the power of open apis to bring in all of this data assimilate it and truly analyze this data to get a 360 view of the customer's journey is at the heart of building a really effective customer experience program so then i take you to our next customer now the here really the the problem here was that you know you had a you had a brand a very very good brand which oh sorry this is not the slide sorry uh, you had a brand which basically had a problem with, in banking they had a massive investment which was planned and the hypothesis was very simple and the hypothesis was that we want to set up digital lobbies because the world is going digital and it seems like a really good idea but when we set up this digital lobby it is an incredibly expensive exercise so what are we going to do that if you have customers over let's say 18 countries and you want to set up digital lobbies in 18 countries maybe hundreds of thousands of them that's probably tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of expense so you have two choices set up all of them and find out whether it worked or not or the second really was to understand what's going wrong and run our hypotheses on a smaller set and try to make it better so the problems they were facing when they set up a very small number of digital lobbies was that a lot of transactions were being abandoned midway a very high number of people were asking for human assistance and anyone who's run a contact center knows that the best contact center interaction is one you never have uh, so if people are reaching out to support it's probably already problematic and obviously low number of people because of their experiences were moving to this digital channel so you have two choices give up or run a real cx print on that and what essentially was done and this is a slightly busy slide so ignore the text on the left but really focus on the boxes on the right so we set up a sort of a five step program and said let's start by listening to customers let's understand at a statistically significant sample but not so large that you spent millions of dollars on it to understand what customers are saying let's marry that with transactional data if someone says i'll give a small example if you go to a restaurant and you said your food sucks it's very important to know what you ate you probably have 100 items in the menu and one sucks which which is possible but if you just say let's fire the chef and change the menu because somebody says the food sucks you probably don't not taking a data driven approach so analyzing data is the equivalent of understanding what's the correlation between customers who say food was bad and what they were eating and if you are able to triangulate so we took a lot of systems data to understand who are these customers where were they coming from what transactions did they want to achieve right and what outcomes and or what roadblocks uh, they faced so based on listening to customers and analyzing the data we actually were able to build a hypothesis around what might be the problem but that's not the end of the story we went back and validated that problem so for example we said okay if x is the problem and this transaction is hard make that button bigger or enable uh, a greater way to like maybe lesser number of steps to get a certain transaction done or give some pop ups ahead of time so that the customer knows what they're signing up for once you drove that change at a smaller sort of a number and you saw the difference in the customer's experience the escalation rates and everything you knew that you could implement it and you could scale this and what we saw as a result was incredible now we saw an incredible growth obviously in the usage of the digital lobby which is exactly what the original use case was but also a very significant uptick in the customer sentiment but the most important uptake for anybody who's in the contact center okay. business jamie i'd love for you to talk about it uh is point number 3 yeah i i mean in in this case in particular you know people were reaching out for human assistance purely because they were having such a poor experience with the digital um assistant right and uh in this particular case a 26% decrease in customer uh in the customers having to reach out to get that human assistance 
And that, that was purely by understanding, as we said before, putting the customer first and understanding their journey along the process and where they were not enjoying the journey, where their sentiment was going down because something wasn't working for them. Um, and then being able to address that particular problem. You know, the, the, the problem wasn't, or the solution wasn't to get rid of the digital lobbies altogether. There were just small tweaks that needed to be made along the way in, in the interaction with, with that digital lobby. And, you know, we're seeing that across many different um, um, use cases, I, I guess. And the fact that we can now use technology to understand your customers, not only understand what they're doing, but but predict, you know, what their next action might be and then get ahead of that, right? And and the use case for this this type of scenario uh, can be many and varied across very, very different uh, applications or, or, or uh, industries. Um, but it's about being able to really truly understand your customer sentiment along every step of their journey and then being able to act proactively before they tell you that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's the key um, you know, result with, with this customer case study in particular. I'm glad you say that because my next pillar is predict. But the point I want to make uh, amplify here is the fact that nobody ever reaches out to the contact center for the first time to complain about the contact center. They're usually calling you because, as Jamie said, something is broken somewhere else. And any customer care plan or program is, is incomplete unless you have the ability to understand the customer's experience at touch points outside of the contact center and your ability to preempt those issues from happening to begin with. And that is why this is one of my favorite use cases because it truly had very simple, if I told you that we could reduce 26% of your contacts in a volume, you could probably do the math in the next 30 seconds as to how much money that could save you. So moving on to predict, Jamie mentioned predict and preempt a couple of times and really at the heart of a well-tuned customer experience program is not just to post-mortem why what happened, it is to predict what actions we can take today to create the business outcomes we want. So if you are the kind of company which has an NPS goal or a churn prevention goal or a, um, a net retention goal, you'd ideally want data and analytics that don't tell you after the year is done why you didn't hit your goal. You basically want something like what you see on screen, which allows you to move all the variables you can move and see what the likely impact of that is on the metric that you care about. And that power of preemption is where a great customer experience program goes. And, and, and the heart of that really is there's obvious insight, right? So for example, if I told, just showed your data and did a little bit of correlation and said 70% um, of, uh, you know, of your detractors are women, it's very easy to say women don't like our brand. So let's do more to engage women. There's probably other drivers of that preference, right? Which could do with other attributes of your service, which need to be fixed as opposed to simply trying to say, let's offer a, let's say a deeper discount for women to shop with us. So going with obvious insights and the most proximate cause of failure is usually the number one reason why a lot of CX programs fail. So if you look at data and you're able to give absolute predictive models on how you can impact customer outcomes, then you can truly run an effective prediction program. So the, the case in point here is a hospitality chain, which also had a sort of an entertainment and casino kind of a wing which got more than 40 million visitors annually. And for them, the point was, look, the, the customer satisfaction scores were low, but many attributes were rated poorly. So if I were to tell you, um, uh, I take a restaurant example because something all of us relate to, not all of us may relate to a casino. But the point is, if I told you, hey, the icon was not bad, the server didn't come on time, the food was whatever, the music was a little loud, what do you do? You either shut down the restaurant or you figure out which of these problems actually have the greatest impact on the customer's propensity or willingness to come back. So the ability to understand what attribute of experience drives the outcome that you care about, which is the customer coming back, for example, right? Or an NPS is incredibly important. So I'm gonna show you a very busy slide. So you know, it, it is busy for a reason because what it shows you is that there is an overall satisfaction with the experience on the right. And there are a certain number of direct parameters that impact it, but there's indirect drivers. So using path analysis, which is a model I absolutely love, we found out that the variety of slot games offered had the highest impact on, um, um, on the uh, overall satisfaction. Now, let me take a pause. If I told you that the variety of slot games offered is the number one reason for detraction, you're gonna have to go and do a very expensive remodel of your gaming flow. Buy new games, shut out old games, shut down the flow for some time, right? 
And that's a lot of money you're going to be spending. But what we found was people who rated the ease of finding slot games poorly invariably assumed or had the impression that the variety of slot games is poor and ultimately drove your overall satisfaction low. So our hypothesis using path analysis was that the real driver of customer experience is actually the ease of finding your slot machines as opposed to the actual variety. A lack of ease uh, of finding slot machine uh, locations was actually driving a perception that your, your variety was poor. So again, going back to my favorite restaurant example, it is the equivalent of you know, your food's taste and visual appeal. So if your food has really poor visual appeal and it looks really, really, really bad, it's quite likely that the customer probably says the taste is bad. Now, if you were to maybe fix the visual appeal, maybe unless the food's really bad, in which case you don't have a choice, sometimes the perception of taste actually increases. So knowing what is actually driving customer disaffection is incredibly important. And that is really what we drove with that, that customer. But in all of these, when you, so I think, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the last thing that I didn't tell you here, obviously, was they worked on signage. So instead of changing the games and the remodeling the flow and buying new games and shutting down the flow, they actually invested in digital signage and lobby ambassadors. So the lobby ambassadors and the digital signage actually helped customers reach the kind of slot machines they liked. And they saw a massive uptick in customer experience. So sometimes seemingly expensive problems have relatively inexpensive solutions. And that's really the point you get with predictive analytics. So if you see all the changes made in all of these programs, with either analyzing the data, changing the orientation of the digital lobby, or changing the way someone finds slot machines, or reorganizing uh, teams by customer journeys, you'll realize that the most important attribute is there has to be cross-functional collaboration. The reason I'm coming to the theory after the practice is very easy to say this without the examples, but in any of the examples you saw before, if your leadership was not bought in, and if your cross-functional leaders were not part of the CX program, none of those changes could be possibly driven because all of those changes involve maybe four or five different teams or departments to lean in and believe that that is important for them to do. And that's where the power play is collaboration with the experience leader or the council of business leaders. So we always believe that you must have experienced leaders and we'll talk a little bit about it a little later, but really everybody on the high table needs to have a stake in improving customer experience. It's not a siloized team that sits in the corner and tries to improve customer experience. So this brings me to the theory of building that customer experience program. Really the pillars of a customer experience program are obviously you have the overhang of a large uh, digital strategy. You obviously need an analytics and insight strategy and team, and you need to start with program governance. But the four stages inside really are the ability to get continuous feedback. Mind you, a lot of people say surveys don't work. I have two, two uh, inputs on that. One, interestingly enough, they do. Uh, as much as we hate it, <laughs> the, the quantum of surveys we see people respond to is, is not diminishing. The point is don't send them a 20 minute survey. Nobody's got 20 minutes for you. The point is to impart relevance and context to that. But more importantly, feedback is not always a survey. A feedback could be listening to unstructured data and analyzing it. Feedback could be unsolicited. Feedback could be transactional data. Everything is feedback. So when I say feedback, I really mean the ability to engage in direct or indirect conversations with the customer on a continuous basis. The second is democratization. If you have an NPS score and I unveil it like the latest iPhone to my, my regional leaders once a quarter, then it becomes a beating stick. But if all of them know the score, what drives the score and how you can improve it, everyone becomes part of that change. Now, the next thing obviously is to take business action based on insights. It should not be the most highly paid exec in the room, which is what happens when there's no data. But the critical success of these programs is translating these actions to the front line. But before you do any of these, I'm assuming almost everybody on this call is in a for-profit company. And a for-profit company has to do one the profits. So I want to actually ask Jamie a question. Again, Jamie, you, you engage with business leaders across, like, I don't know, dozens of countries. Your, your region is significantly large and culturally diverse. And most times the conversation actually starts with customer experience as opposed to how many seats of the contact center you want. So I really want to ask you what business outcomes you've seen are important to business leaders and more importantly with an eye of the future. 
Yeah, sure. No, and and you know, it's a good point. You know, when you talk to people and, and they say they want to implement programs or you know, looking at um, uh, looking at new technology within their contact center, I guess the first question that we ask, and the first question you should all be asking yourself is is why, right? What's the purpose? Why am I doing this? Um, and that overarching uh, goal or outcome for the company should then filter down and drive what what the pe- the key business drivers of the pe- key business outcomes you're looking to achieve throughout different touch points of, of the organization. You know, obviously, we, and we've seen a shift in business outcomes. I think over the years, right? We've gone, especially in the contact center. In the contact center, we've gone from you know, as you mentioned earlier, Vinod, you know, average handling times and trying to reduce the amount of average hand, uh, the amount of time that agents are spending on the phone, and and why? Because it was costing the company money. So now, utilizing technology to make to, to not necessarily reduce the amount of time the agent spends on the phone, but improve the quality of the time that the agent is spending on the phone, um, which would in turn increase things like customer satisfaction or or or, or NPS or customer effort scores. Um, you know, so it's really important, you know, as I said, to, to make sure you're understanding why, what, what business outcome you are looking to achieve. And it might be everything, it might be everything you see here on the screen. You know, each one of those might be, might be a priority for you. I think it's important to rank them um, and have those, as we mentioned earlier, have those, um, those key, the business leaders that are, that are owning the journey for each customer interaction, for them to understand what's the most important one for them. And tying their metrics and their metrics back back to that, um, you know, and, and and as we said, listening to that customer feedback. And the, the biggest thing that I guess I've seen, um, while most customers are attempting to do it, I don't feel everybody's doing it well. And you know, we're getting that feedback, but we're not necessarily closing the loop on that feedback. You know, a lot of companies that are grabbing that grabbing that that feedback and looking at it internally and talking about it, but they're never going back to the customer and closing the loop and making sure they're rounding out that process. So that's really important. And again, it ties back to, um, you know, probably customer churn and and that that customer satisfaction metric um, in making sure your customers are engaged with your organization and and you're improving the way they they interact. You know, you mentioned something around closing the loop and funny enough, that is on my next slide. So let's now come to trying to bring the theory of the, the building the CX program together, which is really around you need to understand when you start a CX program, where on the spectrum you sit. It's very easy to say, my goal in the first year is to move my NPS. It might not be. If you're setting up a CX program, your goal in the first year might be to establish a baseline of NPS as opposed to improving NPS, right? So it's hard to build the 12th floor when the basement's not ready. So the point we're trying to make here is that building a CX program has multiple stages. You've seen the six stages here, but I actually want to go to the next slide and show you what each of these six stages entail. So if you look at stage one, right, that what we're trying to do is you're trying to understand what the customer journey is, uh, build out the ability to sort of uh, engage the customer, collect feedback, and set a baseline around customer experience. It doesn't matter what people in your space are scored at. What truly matters is how do your customers feel about you? That number could be one, could be 100, could be anything in between or minus, doesn't matter. You need to know where you're at because you need to first make relative uh, uh, progress as opposed to absolute ones against somebody else. Now, when you have a baseline set, the next thing you want to do, obviously, is to the leading indicators of sentiment from behavior. The third phase of that, and Jamie mentioned this, I will tell you one thing. If you don't do anything with your CX program and all of these slides are useless, do one thing. Please close the loop, uh, close the loop with your customers. If you get good feedback, thank them for it. If you get ambivalent feedback, show them that you've read it and give them your own input to that. If you get really bad feedback, go back, apologize, and tell them we want to understand, we want to get better. The number of customers, and I can say this with great confidence, who've left the brand after poor experience, when they see an insane amount of lean-in from the brand to correct it, be apologetic, to want to make it better, the number of customers who leave irrespective of that is as close to zero as can be. In fact, somebody once said on a panel that I hosted that the greatest chance to delight a customer is when they're a detractor. Now, the, the, the model of the story is not to create detractors. The model of the story is at that time, if you don't close the loop, you're effectively telling your customers that you truly don't care about them. So service failure is understandable. I'm not saying acceptable, but it is possible. It happens to every brand in the world, but not closing the loop with an unhappy customer is not acceptable. And that should not happen. But let's assume you have more aspirational 
uh, uh, goals with that. The next really is to set up forward-looking goals and targets to achieve, saying, look, if we know the baseline of customer experience, we understand what drives sentiment. The next is to truly align teams and say, all of you have these X, Y, or Z goals, which contribute to customer experience. The very important part is not all teams need to be incentivized on just that CX metric. Because if you're in the logistics, supplies, and delivery team, you have a different set of KPIs that indicate success to you. So you need to understand a way to correlate the CX metric to the business outcome metric that that team is run by and give them that as a KPI as opposed to just a CX score. But once you've done all of this, you're starting to now track CX ROI, which means you understand what happens when you do certain things and then you experiment, you validate, and you continue to make changes in your model because you know some things that work. And once you've done all of this, you're at the top of the apex tree. Basically, you're the Maslow's hierarchy, you're on top of the apex pretty much. And you say, now predicting and nudging behavior. You know before the customer does what they want, and you predict that and you give them experiences that they seek, and in some cases, nudge them towards experiences that they should be looking out for. And that is really when you don't need to attend this webinar anymore, and you have the perfect CX program. In the meantime, there's some data here to, to uh, uh, inspire all of us. Forrester obviously has looked at hundreds of companies in the space. And the single most important reason for us as for-profit companies to do this is simply because this is one of those things which are good for everybody. It's good for your customers, but experience-left companies actually grew 1.4 times faster and increased their revenue 1.6 times more than comparable companies in the last year. So that's the single reason why you should be doing this. So I'll leave you with three actions to take, none of which are small, but it needs leadership buy-in. Action number one really is you must establish a CX governance model. You need to understand what your program is, what you're trying to achieve, and how will you bring different stakeholders together. If CX is a siloed team in your organization that does not sit on the high table and nobody else in the company knows what you do, you're probably set up for failure. The next, obviously, Jamie honed on it multiple times, which was define the business outcomes that matter. The end output of a customer experience program does not have to be happy customers. That's nice, but happy customers translate to very tangible business outcomes, and it is perfectly okay to be very hard-nosed about it and say, my NPS needs to go up so much, my churn needs to reduce by so much, my, my customer retention needs to go up by so much. It is perfectly okay because you're going about it the right way. And start, please start with the customer journey. And that's where a customer program is built. So Jamie, Closing thoughts with you, just your perspective to close this all out. Yeah, sure, sure, uh, no, uh, You know, I think that last point, you know, starting with the customer journey, I think that's the most important part here, right? And we're seeing, as we spoke, as Vinod spoke earlier, we're seeing, I'm certainly seeing and talking to customers, that siloed approach where you've got, you know, you guys who are predominantly the, the contact center leaders within, within an organization who are the interface, the front line, you know, your teams are the front line to your customers. But CX programs of the past have generally been run by a completely different division. And what we're seeing and, you know, what we, what we need to do is, is understand that customer journey and then bring those silos together, right? And make sure that you're collecting data across each part of the journey. Make sure that people are accountable for each part of the journey. But more, most importantly, you're sharing that information, sharing that data and making sure that it's being driven to, a, to that higher um, business outcome. Um, I, I guess, you know, as I'm sure... Hopefully, many of you on the on the call today, are, um, uh, you know, the reason you're here is because this is of interest to you. You know, we're seeing more and more specifically contact centers wanting to get closer with their customers and understand their customers' journey. And um, you know, the, the the great thing for you guys today is, um, you know, the technology is there. The technology is there to help you through that process and help you understand your customer and interact better and you know, improve the metrics that you're looking to improve. Um, so yeah, we hope hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm not sure Fiona if we're, if we're able to go to, to questions or even on the chat and, and throw to some questions, but you know should certainly would be open to you know uh, talking with you one on one if there's anybody on, on the call that would like to learn more and take a deeper look um, into the technology and how it can be applied to your specific business. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks, Fiona. I find it very courageous that you've actually left your audience with homework. Um, so thanks for that. So they've got three steps that they need to undertake. Very cheeky of you, giving people to uh, have some work. Um, so we do have some questions that have come in, uh, and I'm going to try and put them into some sort of logical progression, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't know if you know whether this is for you or for you, Jamie. 
how do we sell the need for CX in our organisation? I can give it a go and, and Jamie can go next. Um, you know, five years ago, my answer was different and it changes with time because obviously more facts emerge. In 2020, going into 2021, if you're selling the need for CX, you're probably working for the wrong company. I'll, and I know it sounds very contentious, but that is actually true. In 2015, I completely empathize with the question, a leadership team that says this is soft and fuzzy, this doesn't, doesn't make sense. But in 2020, a leadership team does not have the right not to put CX at the heart of everything they do. That said, it is a fair question to ask, what's, if you're gonna ask me for X amount of money and manpower and investment, what do we get for it? And there really, uh, you have to go back to the pieces on the deck wherein we said, the, you have to hypothesize, like kind of put together a question, which is, this is our company's goal, which is what we're committing to our shareholders or whatever. It could be an NPS growth goal, uh, a customer retention goal. And the sell is, what if I help all the teams in the company understand what they could do to their respective functions, slightly better, slightly faster, slightly differently, which helps us all collectively achieve that overarching business goal. If you sell it like that, it is an infinitely more palatable proposition than uh, a fuzzy CX program whose end outcome is a smiley. That usually is hard for an analytical leader to, to consume. But Jamie, I don't know if you have a different perspective to that. No, I think you summed it up well, Bernard. All right. There you go. Well, we have a question from Margie, uh, who works in the public sector in local government. Um, with the view of the CX that you presented today, how does it fit into a CRM or a customer engagement centre? Okay, that's a good question. So CRM and customer engagement systems are at the heart of and complementary to a CX program, right? So when you build out a CX program, when you build out these customer journeys, a lot of the data that you need to build out these journeys actually sits in the CRM. So if you remember step two, which was analyze, it, it spoke about the need to deeply integrate with systems. So the WebEx experience management system integrates into Salesforce and Dynamics and all sorts of systems because demographic data, transactional data, loyalty data, all of that sits in those systems. So definitely a strong CRM uh, technology stack is very helpful. And integrating that into your customer experience program is almost step one. Uh, for me, the number one reason programs, CX programs reach a point and then plateau, wherein the ROI doesn't really shine through, is because you don't have enough systemic data into the, into the program. You also spoke about customer engagement systems. That's a very interesting one, because when you understand a customer's journey, if you remember the apex of the CX program was predict and nudge behavior. If you knew what propensity a customer has at a certain step of their customer journey, you can actually use your journey-based customer engagement solutions to either give them the right offer, suggest the next action to them, help them choose, let's say, an escalation to an agent, because you know at this stage when a customer doesn't get what they want, they usually drop off or churn or give you poor feedback. So having a strong engagement solution at the heart of it allows you to interject the customer's journey and give an offer or an action or the ability to give feedback or escalate to support effectively on a real-time basis. So CRM is, sits sort of is the pedestal on which the CX program sits and the engagement platform is the one you can use to orchestrate actions with the customer to do the prediction and the nudging of the customer along the customer journey. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, a very political question or could be perceived as a political question. Who owns CX in an organization? Oopsie. All right. So again, my answer changes with time, but now I'm, I have a great degree of conviction on the answer itself. Now, people usually say everyone owns CX, and my point is, uh, no. If everyone owns CX, nobody does. So there has to be a customer experience leader. Instantly enough, at Cisco, we ran a survey of, I think, 700 contacts and executives, and we found that more than 50% of them report into some sort of a CX leader today. That is incredible. This is a leader who sits on the high table, reports to the CEO, and pretty much owns all aspects of customer experience. So you must have a leader, but it's very important that two or three things happen with that. One, that leader must be on the executive leadership team of the company. If not, 
it doesn't if it rolls into marketing or some other team the the program is bound to fail the second that leader must be armed with a cx governance council which means leaders of all key uh, teams and departments who sit on the elt must have a shared goaling along with the cx leader so that they also lean in and know that some of the outcomes that this leader has to power are actually part of their kpis too so owned by a cx leader in name and title sitting on the executive leadership team reporting to the ceo of the company and armed and abetted sort of by a governance council which is all the key leaders in the company who are equally accountable to some of these outcomes then the answer to who owns the cx program is relevant Okay, we have a cheeky question. I'm going. I'm going to call it uh, from Deepak. Deepak says many companies have ditched Net Promoter Score, and CEOs are already feeling tired by CX and CX consultants. Is there two or three silver bullet statements that can break through to a CEO? Excellent. Uh, first thing. Uh, Net promote. So, if an organization or a CEO believes NPS stands for Net Promoter Score, so the first thing you can do to fact find is what is the full form of NPS? And everyone says Net Promoter Score. That is actually the wrong answer. It is Net Promoter System. Now, if you run uh, an NPS survey and you measured some scores and then you threw some spaghetti on the wall and then you measured NPS again and it improved or decreased or whatever, you are very right in saying that. NPS doesn't work. But if you follow the S of NPS, which is a system, by the way, I'm not selling NPS. You can use OSAT, CSAT, you can use uh, a custom metric, you can use the Vinod Happiness Index, all of those are allowed. Okay? The point is if you use, <laughs> all of those are okay. But the point is, if you use NPS, you have to understand the S system. Unless you set up the entire system, which is the inner loop, which is closing the loop with the customers, and the outer loop, which is analyzing all the data and insights and making systemic changes to your customer journey, you're not running a net promoter system. So the first thing really is, if you understand the difference between a score and a system, and we've tried the system and it doesn't work, then a fair rub. If you've measured the score three times and nothing, you have no idea what's happening, it, is, it means you're not running a system. That is one. The second really is the Forrester data. Again, that's not NPS driven, obviously. Forrester has its own index, which is very powerful. There is very clear statistical evidence across hundreds and thousands of companies with regards to what CX-led transformation does, right? So if you want data, facts, and tons of anecdotal evidence, this is no longer leading. It's You have a lot of trailing evidence in terms of what CX-led companies have, have done in terms of transforming their businesses. The third really is, is the philosophical question, which is, do we want to build a world that 10 of us in this ivory tower believe should be built? Or do we want to create the world that millions of our customers out there want to experience, revel in, and continue to experience again and again? If the answer to that is yes, then leaning into the customer journey, understanding their own journey is at the heart of why you need to run a customer experience program. Last, I, will, I, I know I said last, but there's one more last point. If, if your CEO can put his or her hand up and say, name 20, Okay, 10 to 20, I, you know what, let's make it 10. 10 brands that they love, that they will always do business with and never leave, and those brands can be sure of their share of wallet for the next 10 years, then you don't need a CX program. Nobody can name 10 such brands. And remember, you are one of the 10 brands that are not in that top 10. So if you're not there and you don't feel the same about your brand and brands around you, you know that you need to lean in and earn customer loyalty. So I don't know if those are silver bulletish enough, but uh, I think these are the conversations you need to have with your leadership team. Okay. An another question that's come in. Um, how do we align different stakeholders, all of whom run on different KPIs, around the CX program? I'm glad to say that. So I heard from a CX leader at a large bank who I absolutely respect, and he said, you know, my team's goal is not to take NPS like a beating stick and go tell everyone, hey, your NPS has gone down whack, right? Hey, your NPS is going down whack. Then NPS becomes the enemy or the score becomes the enemy, right? And he said, my team's job is to bask in what he called reflected glory, which meant if you help, let's say the sales team, if you did what you did and whatever actions you did, 
in terms of delighting the customer, making their purchase experience easy, and all of that help you sell more, the sales leader is successful, right? And the sales leader goes up on stage, is celebrated because he or she is like crushing their numbers. And then they come back and say, oh, how did you do it? Oh, we did this, we invested in the customer, we did ABC, and now the customer is buying more from us, right? When you do that, you have helped that customer not achieve an NPS or a CX goal. You've helped them achieve their goal. And when they go back and understand what drove that change, a key contributor, not 100%, right? A key contributor would be, oh, wow, I actually invested in my customer experience. My customers love me more. I stood by them in their moments of, of strife, and hence they are buying more from me. So they come back and say, wow, the CX program works. So don't throw your KPIs at them. Find a way for your KPI to help them increase their core KPI for which they were hired and bask in reflected glory. Do not make your CX metric the overarching shiny goal because nobody outside the CX team is compensated on that. Even if they are, they don't totally understand it. So that's really my thought. Uh, invest in their KPI, bask in reflected glory. Don't make your CX metric the be all and end all of anybody's operations. Cool. We've got two more questions that I'd, I'd like to uh, ask today. Um, Finod, can you go a little bit deeper on how we could demonstrate the return on investment for the CX program? Oh, absolutely. If you have basic data on lifetime value of a customer, um, uh, uh, and that's fairly easy to, to guess, right, or even pull out from your systems, you should simply be looking at two things. One, at the heart of it is the CX metric, right? All of this analysis was to see how all these experiential attributes impact my CX metric. The second part of analysis is how does my CX metric go and impact my business outcomes, right? So if you're able to build a model which says every net retained customer pays me $122 a year and then they stay for five to seven years, there's models available for that. So every saved customer is worth X amount of dollars for me, right? And then you look at your CX program and you see before and after data and say, what's happened to my retention? So that's a very, very simple way of doing it. The second way you saw path analysis. Path analysis allows you to break that intermediary and say, what is the impact on these drivers of customer experience directly onto business outcomes? You pick an anchor metric, you pick your dependent and independent variables, and your anchor metric there can be, let's say, average revenue per user, right? Before the program started, analyze the data, invest in the things you believe the model tells you you need to invest in, and then actually track movement in that metric. So with path analysis, you can actually do this direct, but in larger programs, you need to understand what is the impact of movement in the CX metric on these outcomes. Have your data like average revenue per user or lifetime value or whatever, right? And finish it. I'll give you a last example. In an insurance company, we did the same thing in the value of death, which was essentially, you know, your renewal period. You don't come back and you go and nobody knows why you left. And the amount of money insurance companies lose just because someone was too lazy or didn't care to renew some small insurance is tens of millions. So if we told you that we'll reduce that drop off by 5% and you do that math and you say, wow, that's like $10 million, then you have a very clearly tangible way of measuring the ROI of the program. Okay. And the last question, it's from Andrew. Andrew would like to know, are there any plans to combine the CX technology Cisco have with the contact center portfolio? Oh, I'm glad you say that because uh, that's exactly why we got acquired. So at this point in time, <laughs> the customer experience platform is completely integrated into a, a contact center portfolio, which means the contact center now as a very powerful touch point measures the agent experience, right? Experience of the customers uh, uh, there and obviously the agent's experience. It gives an agent level and a supervisor level view of the voice of the customer. And future plans include allowing you to drive your routing and your agent matching basis customer sentiment. So if certain types of customers do better with certain kinds of agent, how do you evolve the system and get the right kind of customers to meet the right kind of agents, right? And in better pairing just lies infinite uh, possibility. So short answer, yes, it is integrated, but a lot of our roadmap stuff around making our journeys richer and contributing to orchestration, next best action, and, and uh, routing and pairing are currently in progress. So right now we're looking at CX, our platform, very tightly integrated with the contacts and the platform itself. 
Well, thank you, Vinon. I cannot believe that we're already at the hour and our time is up. Thank you to you and to Jamie for your wonderful insights, especially the strengths of the data that you shared in those case studies. I mean, they speak for themselves. Of course, if anybody that's attended today would like to contact uh, Cisco for any further support or assistance. We can certainly create that pathway for you into Cisco. Uh, with that, I thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you might be, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.